Great Lakes Now, Connect, is a co-production of Detroit Public Television and The Nature Conservancy. Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and welcome to Great Lakes Now Connect, a program created by Detroit Public Television and The Nature Conservancy to focus on the biggest issues facing the Great Lakes and the impact they have on all of us living around the Great Lakes Basin in eight states and two provinces of Canada. We're glad that you could join us for our third program in this series. We've gathered experts from around the basin, and for the next two hours, we're taking a close look at investing in nature. It's crucial that we keep our water source clean, that we know. But it's not just the lakes themselves that need to be protected. There are many factors, coastal areas, fisheries, forests, all affect the Great Lakes system and they need investment as well. Clean air, fresh water, food, the basic essentials of life, the raw materials of society. Nature provides these for our every need. There's an interplay between the forest and the stream the air and the trees, the marsh and the lake. Healthy natural systems produce clean and abundant resources, promoting healthy people and healthy economies. Investing in nature is an idea that has been around for quite a long time, maybe even centuries. You know, we're used to looking to nature for our sustenance, for food from fish or timber to build structures, but it's really starting to expand and grow well beyond that. So examples of these newer ways are thinking about nature as a water infrastructure and we think about turning on the tap and getting water, but it really starts in the watershed far upstream where soils and trees and wetlands filter it and keep it clean. The lakes and rivers in the region here aren't just home to plants and animals. They're places we like to go with our families to enjoy the scenery or to go boating and fishing. They're supporting our fisheries. It's really not just a matter of you know, having important natural systems for their own sake, but our nature here in the Great Lakes is really supporting the people in the region, the economies. You can see ecosystems providing services almost everywhere, from the farms where plants buffer rivers from fertilizer, to cities where stormwater is absorbed by rain gardens. There's lots of interest now in bringing that kind of nature and the benefits we get from it right into cities where most of us live. Cities like Detroit that have options for you know, redevelopment are really prime for this kind of thinking. There's a lot of space and opportunity to really change the way you envision a city. Water is essential to most Great Lakes businesses. Companies that use a lot of water have a vested interest in the hydrology of the region, looking to experts that can restore the habitat that feeds the rivers and groundwater they use for their business. It's really a chance for the conservation community to work together with companies to come up with new solutions that are benefiting both companies' bottom lines as well as the, the health of our planet. Food, water, air, wetlands, forests, lakes and streams, the building blocks of life from nature. These are ecosystem services, and they're worth every penny. And that was Ed Moore reporting for us. And it is a good look at what we're focusing on today. Let's head into our first panel now. They're going to be talking about nature's benefits to people, economies, and quality of life. Catherine Call is the moderator, and she is the Conservation Policy and Practices Specialist with the Nature Conservancy. Catherine? Thank you. Um, as Christy said, I'm Katie Call. I'm the Conservation Policy and Practices Specialist for the Nature Conservancy in Michigan and the Great Lakes. And today we're pleased to have with us Dr. Steve Pulaski, the Fessler Lampert Professor of Ecological and Environmental Economics at the University of Minnesota. We have Heather Starrett. She's the Great Lakes Regional Coordinator for NOAA's National Ocean Service and their Coastal Services Center. Uh, John Fosgett, owner and forest management specialist with Compass Land Consultants, and Dr. Amanda Weinstein from the Economics Department of Univers at University of Akron. Thanks to you all for being here today and welcome. Thank you. Um, we just saw a video featuring two of the Nature Conservancy's top scientists introducing and defining ecosystem services and really talking to us about them being um, nature's benefits to people. Our CEO, Mark Tursik, recently released a book entitled Investing in Nature, and it relays um, some examples from around the world of where different ecological and economically viable um, solutions, win-win solutions for people in nature, have been achieved. So, you know, it, it's timely that we're talking about um, these issues today because it's, it's touching the work that a, a lot of us do. So today we really want to focus in on the Great Lakes, though. And um, Steve, maybe we can start with you. Um, what are some defining ecosystem services in this region? Why is this something important for us to be talking about 
right now? Right. Well, I think uh, you know the term ecosystem services, the the benefits to people. I mean, that really, you know, this really is the the benefits of nature to people. So, how do people in the Great Lakes benefit from things that happen in ecosystems? Clearly, the water is important. It was mentioned in the video. The are the Great Lakes states. I live in Minnesota, where the land of ten thousand lakes. Um, but what happens in the water or the water quality depends upon what happens upland. So what happens on the land affects what happens in the water. And clearly we all benefit when we have clean water for drinking, uh, for recreation. Uh, there's been studies both in Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota of the value to property owners if you live on a clean lake versus a less clean lake. So, so clearly water and the services, recreation and drinking and so forth from water um, are, are vitally important to people in this area. But as was suggested on the video, it goes much, much broader than that too. Uh, the food we eat. Well, uh, many of the foods need to be, uh, the crops need to be pollinated. Uh, many of the uh, fruit crops um, uh, need natural pollinators. So are we, what are we doing with uh, habitat for, for those pollinators? Uh, pest control, similarly in agriculture. But even in cities, uh, where we wouldn't think about nature playing such a large role, um, uh, just planting of trees in cities can, can reduce the urban heat island effect so that during the summers we don't have to have so much air conditioning or planting shade trees uh, by the house. So there's many, many ways that if we learn how to work with nature, we, we benefit. Mm -hmm. And all these systems aren't necessarily created equal. I mean, you were, you were saying that we depend on natural pollinators for a lot of, for our food, whether it's commercially grown agriculture or hand-picked fruits. And um, there's a big wine growing industry, I know, in, in Michigan as well and, and throughout a lot of the region. So um, biodiversity and, and healthy habitats are important. Um, I guess, Heather, following up on that, I mean, as we think about our Great Lakes coastal system, Steve's talking about water. Help us understand what a, what a coastal system looks like in the Great Lakes? Is it um, a rocky shoreline? Is it sandy? How do people interact with the coast? How, do they, how are they impacted by it? Why should we, why should we care about these coastal systems beyond, the, beyond what Steve was saying? Sure, well, I think um, for the Great Lakes region, it really is the pulse of our economy. Uh, it's where the nexus between our human dimensions, the place where people live, work, and play on a regular basis, um, really intersects with our uh, commerce, our transportation, uh, the recreational activities that really drive the cultures of, of the Great Lakes um, as we know it. Uh, I too come from Minnesota, but um, you know there's that culture of going up north to the cabin and spending time along the shore and looking for agates. You know we don't have seashells, but we look for agates. Um, those are the types of things that I think really define our culture um, here in the lakes. You know, I think also it's important to note that when we think about ecosystem services in the context of our coastal realm, um, we start to think about those areas where you get a lot of return on investment for investing in, in the nature of those ecosystems. So in the coastal realm, uh, we think about things like wetlands. Uh, and they produce, you know, a variety of benefits, uh, not the least of which would include things like um, protection from, from flooding. Um, they absorb the energy when we have large coastal storms. Uh, last year, I believe it was, that we experienced some of the flooding and wave actions that were associated with Hurricane Sandy coming all the way in inland from the Atlantic coast. Um, and then, you know, third, uh, we also see this, this important um, relationship in helping us to mitigate climate effects uh, by ha acting and serving a, as carbon storage sinks for, for our region and, and throughout the coastal realm. I think one other thing that we do um, in the coastal realm which is really important is that um, we have this tremendous cultural heritage in the Great Lakes. Um, it goes without saying that we have a tremendous resource for maritime heritage, for sailing, for being out on the water, for being in relation with the water. You mentioned that, Steve. And, and so, communities benefit and communities. from the tourism that all that brings. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, if we were to uh, be speaking with our, our tribal nations here on this panel, they would be talking about cultural resources in a completely different context. You know, perhaps we would be discussing things like wildlife, moose, and wild rice, and things of that nature. So I think um, 
there's really a myriad of, of things that we could look at in terms of ecosystem benefits in the coastal mm -hmm. realm. Do you see opportunities, or any of you, um, to forge um, some creative solutions in coastal systems or, or the watersheds that, that feed those, that, those near shore areas? I mean, water drains off the land, as Steve was saying, the land is connected to the water. Whatever that water touches on the way into those tributaries is delivered down to the Great Lakes. Um, affecting the, health, the overall health of, of those larger lakes. But do you see um, opportunities right now to develop some creative solutions in, in um, these coastal watersheds that are going to benefit both the conservation value that you're talking about, the cultural value, um, as well as keep those, those communities that are de uh, depending on tourism alive and well? Do you see examples of that happening or opportunities that we should be um, embracing? Sure, and I think you know one of the most real-time uh, opportunities that we see right now is through restoration activities on the ground. So if we look at the return on investment, you know, removing marine debris, for example, from key waterways or navigable channels, um, and actually creating healthy, um, high-quality water, high-quality wildlife habitat for fish, birds, you name it, um, those are some, some very quick returns on investment, I think, for investing in nature. The other thing that comes to mind is um, thinking about um, investing in, in education and trying to get folks more aware of the value of the ecosystem services that are provided by these, these areas as well. I think it will produce um, a lot more uh, stewardship at a local mm -hmm. level. So trying to get folks engaged at the community scale and aware of what those resources are and the values that are associated with them. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. I think when you bring people in, it really lets them see the value of ecosystem services. And I think it also includes some you know, open spaces and parks and recreation that has to do with the lakes. They really see the value, not just for themselves and the recreation value, but they start to see the ecosystem value along with it. So there are, you, you, you said, what can we do or uh, making some progress yeah. on this. And actually in the water area, there's been a number of really nice developments. Um, so if you think about uh, watersheds, you know, what, what happens up in the watershed will affect people downstream. Um, and oftentimes we've, we've, just because of the nature of political jurisdictions or um, lack of ability to coordinate the sort of, what the upstream people do that affects the downstream people it doesn't, you know, there, there's been a, a mismatch or a, a disconnect. disconnect there. Um, but a number of cases, and the Nature Conservancy has played a very positive role here in uh, creating what are called water funds. So people downstream um, say that, that need clean water. So the prime example where this got started was New York City. And they went, uh, they said, well, we're either going to have to take actions upstream in the, in the Catskills and the other places where we get our water to protect this, or we're going to have to build a filtration plant. Well, the filtration plant was going to be really expensive. It was going to cost them six to eight billion dollars, the estimates were. Mm -hmm. Rather than doing that, uh, they worked with uh, landowners and municipalities up in the Catskills to protect the watersheds, provide buffers that would keep the water clean and not have to spend that uh, money uh, doing that. Now this is a clear case where you know bringing together the people who benefit from clean water with the people who take actions that can affect whether that water is clean. You know, it's not only good for nature, but it clearly, was clearly good for the people of New York City. Right. It's a, it was a great forest restoration story and at the same time, as you said, benefited um, all of those residents of New York City who received that drinking water. Um, speaking of forested systems, I think that we do have a video that we'd like to show now that um, kind of translates what sustainable forestry can really, can really do for um, the larger Great Lakes region. When most people think of the Nature Conservancy, they don't think of a forester marking trees and, and harvesting timber. John Fosgood is tagging trees in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Trees soon to meet their end by saw blade. Fosgood helps manage the two-hearted forest reserve for the Nature Conservancy. This is a vast tract of woodlands. It's now a demonstration project to show how a timber harvest will work to benefit everyone. Can you have conservation value in a managed forest too? So the hypothesis is, is that through utilizing the techniques that we're developing, we can have a healthy, diverse forest and still provide a sustainable source of timber and jobs to the economy in Michigan. The northern forests mean billions of dollars each year from the lumber, wood pulp for paper, even firewood for local residents. Timber cutting is this region's heritage and culture. 
It goes back 170 years. The timber industry is what gave Michigan and the Great Lakes its first place in history, really. We supplied not only the region, we supplied the nation and we supplied the world. In the mid-1800s, these forests were literally cleared to help build a emerging society and culture throughout the Midwest. Those forests grew back and those are the same forests that we're trying to conserve today. What you had, what you saw during the period of the 19th century is we completely depleted our northern forest across the entire state of Michigan, which led to everything from the silting in of our rivers and the extirpation of many species, including some charismatic species like the grayling. We had the only Midwest population of Arctic grayling in the Great Lakes. That prized game fish drew anglers here from around the world. The grayling were last seen in the 1930s. Today, there is a lot more concern for our fish and other wildlife. When we first set about our conservation work on the Two-Hearted River watershed, we quickly realized that road stream crossings pose a significant threat to the health of the watershed. The road stream crossings, not done right, stop fish from migrating upstream. If they can't do that, they can't reproduce. Now the foresters and conservationists are working together to remove those barriers, all within the next two years. We'll be one of the first, if not the first, watershed of that size to be completely barrier free. So all of the road stream crossings in the watershed will have been removed and replaced with crossings that are no longer a barrier to fish migration. We're learning more about the complexities of the northern ecosystem. The forest of today is not the forest we had before. At the Two-Hearted Reserve, John Fosgett is working on a restoration plan to get us a bit closer to the way it was back in the 1800s. We know that through past management, our forests have lost a certain degree of their diversity. So we're putting seed trees on the ground in the Two-Hearted. We're creating canopy gaps to try to encourage the growth of mid-tolerant tree species such as yellow birch. The research here goes beyond sustainable timber harvests or better fisheries. It's much bigger than that. A single tree can hold hundreds of gallons of water. Multiply that by the millions and millions of trees. The northern forests affect the water table, water levels, even the climate. Forests have a huge impact on global climate patterns. And one of the things that we are confronted with right now in light of climate change is each forest type has a different water balance in terms of how much water it retains versus how much water it gives back to the atmosphere to feed these clouds like we're seeing above our heads today. And so what we need to understand are how our precipitation patterns are actually going to change as our forests change. The work at the Two-Hearted Reserve should lead to more answers not just about the forest ecosystem, but how to build and support a timber industry that's sustainable environmentally and economically. Everything from the forest product industry to the local municipalities, it has to be about full cost accounting of the cost and benefits of what we're doing. And that's what we're doing there is we're actually getting down and crunching the numbers and saying, what are the benefits to people? Can we sustainably manage those local economies and, and larger regional economies while at the same time we're doing the science on the ground and measuring the real changes and improvements to biodiversity? Well, John, you are engaged in a lot of interesting work in the Upper Peninsula, and I know you work in Wisconsin and Minnesota as well. Can you give us a little um, a picture of where, where are in those states the northern forests are located, and then how are they connected with the, the communities and the economies of that region? Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, the, the northern forest, when we talk about the northern forest, um, when we, we looked at the video you know, in the mid-1800s, the, the, all of Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota was forested. Those forests were cleared, and what wasn't converted to agriculture, the emerging you know, society and towns in the upper Great Lakes, turned back into forests. So those are the forests that we're managing today. In, the, in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, that's about 53 million acres of forest land spread around Lake Superior and then the northern parts of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Um, within that forest, obviously, as we've talked, those forests serve critical 
um, roles in providing clean air and clean water and connectivity for a lot of wildlife species and biodiversity and things that we talk about. But uh, just as important or more importantly, those are centers for economics and the way in which the people in the northern part of this region live. Um, you know, we've got the timber industry, which provides uh, a tremendous number of jobs uh, to the economy. And a lot of those towns that exist in the northern parts of this region uh, most likely wouldn't be there if it wasn't for healthy forests where people could go to work, where people live, where people recreate, and then provide all those other ecosystem services that we talked about here today. So what are some examples of how the forest industry is making choices? I know we saw a little bit of that in the video, but what kind of choices are they making that are providing um, economically and ecologically sustainable opportunities over the long term? Well, the, the forest products industry, um, let's just talk about Michigan. And Michigan provides about $12 billion in economic stimulus to the state every year. Mm -hmm. uh, one in 10 manufacturing jobs in the state of Michigan is related to the forest products industry. Uh, if you look at um, the forest-based recreation industry, um, some figures are that that's another $3 billion to the economy and 50,000 jobs uh, in the state of Michigan alone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, there's a, an, an interest in all of those people who operate, whether recreationally or from a timber production standpoint or timber products, to manage that resource sustainably. And, um, you know, we've done that for a, a lot of years in that part of the world. But we're starting to think now more about conserving these landscapes. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about was in watersheds, that those watershed boundaries cross <clears throat> political boundaries and jurisdictions. Well, the forest cross numerous ownerships. And so the challenges when we talk about protecting the northern forest is that you have to deal with a large number of landowners. It might be, you know, state or public ownership. It might be private ownership. It might be industrial ownership. So what we're starting to do now is look at practices where we can protect that forest across all ownerships so that we can all benefit uh, into the future. Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, you, were, you mentioned that um, forests really kind of drive the, the livelihood of a lot of those northern towns and cities. I know they have an impact downstate too, the, the benefits that folks in Chicago and Detroit and Milwaukee, they, they receive benefits from those forests too in the form of um, the way water, the way water flows downhill as I've heard you say in the past. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the forest play critic. I mean, we talked about water quality, and it, it kind of struck me. You know, we, you know, we, we're, we get to live up there, so we get to play up there too. And I was out on Lake Superior uh, Sunday, and we were off pictured rocks, and, and I kept thinking that we were going to run up on the rocks, and I realized that it was 20 feet of clear water mm -hmm. on top of those rocks, and those forests are responsible for the clarity of that water, mm -hmm. and that water ends up down the lakes. That air is something that we all uh, enjoy in the lake states, and so they really do have a critical function. Although people may not live and work there in the lower parts of the lakes, they certainly provide a lot of the things that we all enjoy. Sounds like a nice Sunday afternoon. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the forest along with the coastal you know, areas and the ecosystem services provide a quality of life and that's really important uh, for regional economic development. It's been showed that natural amenities, you know, having a clean environment, uh, really impact regional economic growth. So you don't have to be an environmental advocacy group to be for a lot of these things. You, it re should really matter that it really impacts whether people are moving to this area and the growth that's happening in these areas. And I was just going to offer, I think, too, that there are some lessons that we can learn in terms of investing in nature about how we manage our landscapes. And I think that's the point that you were trying to make, John. Um, working across interagency groups like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is actively engaged with these landscape conservation uh, cooperatives. It's, it provides a good opportunity for us to be looking at these landscape changes and looking at land use and land cover and how we've managed our lands over time and then looking at how that impacts the near shore or, or doesn't. How has it benefited mm -hmm. the near shore perhaps? Um, so those, those I think are really important, uh, not only dialogues to be having, but also to inform what next steps we might take in our management practices going forward. There might be new opportunities. We're seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, through NOAA and looking at some of these land cover um, change analyses that we're doing, uh, the emergence of new wetlands. Well, that's an opportunity. You know, our coastal programs through, which are um, officiated through the states, that's an opportunity for them to be looking at possible conservation efforts and things of that nature, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One of the 
really interesting things here. I mean, John, as you, you, as you said, there are lots of benefits that come out of forests. And one of the challenges, though, it seems that a landowner or a forest owner, they will get some of those benefits if they sell the timber, um, maybe if they are uh, running a, t a tourist lodge and so forth. But many of these things are um, benefit wider society, and the, the, the forest owner themselves may not actually mm -hmm. capture this. So, for example, uh, it, was, it was brought up that uh, forests play an incredible role in uh, carbon cycling. You know, they store lots of carbon, which otherwise would be in the atmosphere, and uh, enhancing the greenhouse effect. Um, so one would like to reward forest owners for providing that service for society, but right now um, it's, it's very difficult. Now there are some emerging markets uh, for this, but, um, but there are many cases where uh, the services or the benefits that are created by forests are, don't flow back to the, to the forest owner or even the, to the local community. I, I think that's one of the difficult things. And, and I mean, we, we work in, you know, whether it's water or the forest or those kind of things, and, and you don't truly appreciate the interplay between all of those things. And certainly the average landowner doesn't realize that, you know, my management practices are going to have an uh, impact on water quality and air quality and connectivity for, you know, certain species. And so I think there's, a, there's an opportunity or there's a challenge in that there, there, there's a challenge that we need to communicate to the public that, that everything that we do has an impact on all these systems that we all appreciate. And like you say, there's direct ties to timber and those kind of things, but, um, you know, if, if we can figure out how to place value in water quality or air quality, um, then I think that, uh, you know, we can really start to, to move the needle on protecting these large landscapes. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of examples, too, I know, of whether it's in small towns, big cities, coastal towns, those inland of green infrastructure investments really, you know, playing, playing a beneficial role to people who live and work in those communities. Could you talk a little bit, Amanda, about um, some places where, where we're seeing those kinds of benefits? Uh, yeah, so when we talk about green infrastructure, we're talking about using, you know, soil and vegetation and open spaces to help with a whole host of things from uh, helping with floods to storm water, um, to helping with the heat island effect that Steve talked about earlier. And we can see that in a lot of areas. I live near Cleveland, and so Cleveland's actually, um, the EPA's uh, doing research to look at. They have a lot of vacant areas there uh, where we have uh, vacant buildings and vacant lots. So looking at demolishing these buildings and turning these vacant lots into open green space to help with all of these things. And it really has a double benefit of not only helping with the things I just talked about, but also revitalizing these urban neighborhoods. And it can, and that can have an additional benefit of attracting, uh, you know, we've called green migrants. So they're kind of these young professionals who care about these environmental things in their community. Um, and it can also have benefits that we don't even think about. So one is crime. So when you have these vacant lots and these vacant buildings, there's this kind of broken window effect. And fixing that broken window or that vacant lot can actually reduce crime in these areas. So the benefits, um, there are envi environmental benefits, but there are a lot um, of other benefits, you know, including crime and including the area. And just the biggest benefit is really who we attract to that area. And we can attract the young professionals I talked about. And that's really um, how we value a lot of these systems. Do we attract people to this area? And people vote, you know, with their feet of where they want to live. And that's how we can tell how they're valuing these systems. They also vote with their dollar. So we can see how much they're willing to pay for a house. It's one another way we can value these systems. So a lot of times we have policymakers will tout, you know, their low housing prices and isn't this great. But it's not great because it's also a sign that people don't want to live in that area. So it's one way we can value these areas is by looking at housing prices and see do people want to move in these, these areas and the natural amenities and ecosystem services and having clean water is a big impact on how people value an area. And a lot of these green infrastructure approaches, green roofs or rain gardens, um, improve, you know, tearing down buildings that might not be a service to the community anymore um, for urban gardens or parks, those are adding quality of life benefits, aesthetic benefits, as well as the cooling effects you mentioned. But um, just, yeah, improved quality of life that make people want to be in those areas. How, how did, I don't know, maybe the city of Cleveland, for example, where the example you were talking about, how do you, how do they decide um, when to act? What do they grapple with? You know, what are the benefits of action versus inaction, acting now, waiting too long? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, we have upfront costs with these things, with tearing down buildings, you know, making these green spaces. I also lived in Dayton for a number of years, so they've really worked on improving their riverfront, making it open to people using the riverfront for hiking and biking and that sort of thing. 
Uh, and you have upfront costs with that. They uh, tore out a lot of dams so people could use the river for canoeing. Um, and so there is upfront costs to overcome, and people have to understand there's upfront costs. But I think the important thing to focus on for people and for policymakers aren't these upfront costs, it's the long term. And we, we really need to be looking at the long term economics here. And long term economics say that these you know, projects are really worth it. It's worth it for the improved quality of life. It's worth it for the uh, people that we draw into this city and the people that will stay in this city for this improved quality of life. Choose investments in that city over the long term. Mm -hmm. I think we have a video to show now about how uh, one city, I think Sheboygan, Wisconsin, actually chose uh, the choice of action now. So let's take a look. Working together, we have completed all of the dredging and habitat restoration work required to transform this area of concern into an area of recovery. We're celebrating a major accomplishment here in Wisconsin. Uh, we're taking an area of concern, a river that has had uh, pollution problems, and uh, celebrating the restoration of that. Many know the city of Sheboygan, located in Wisconsin along the shores of Lake Michigan, as the bratwurst capital of the world. In summer, Sheboygan bustles with tourists and fishermen who flock to the waterfront for swimming, boating, fishing, and to compete in the Dairyland Classic, the largest freshwater surfing competition in the world. But nearly 30 years ago, Sheboygan became known for more than water sports and brats. Following decades of pollution from nearby urban and industrial sites, the lower Sheboygan River and Harbor was identified as a Great Lakes area of concern. The governments of the U.S. and Canada designated 43 areas of concern around the Great Lakes. These were the most contaminated sites with the legacies of uh, the heaviest toxic pollutants on the lakes. For Sheboygan, the pollution and area of concern designation weighed heavily on the local economy, which relies on clean rivers and lakes to support the tourism and commercial fishing industries. We had a fish advisory for all the fish that were caught here. They contained PCBs and you could have some but not too much of that type of fish. But it wasn't just unsafe to eat the locally caught northern pikes and smallmouth bass. For years, the sediment contamination in the Sheboygan River had made it impossible to dredge the harbor. And without dredging, large commercial fishing ships carrying Lake Michigan trout and salmon would have to dock elsewhere. Determined to make a change, Local, state, and federal agencies came together in 2012, removing 400,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment from the Sheboygan River and Harbor and investing heavily in waterfront habitat restoration. All in all, this cleanup cost just over $80 million. I think there's a lesson in that. Um, the cost of cleaning up environmental contamination is very high. Preventing environmental contamination is much more cost effective. While the cost of environmental cleanup can be daunting, in Sheboygan, the benefits to the local economy are undeniable. One reason we got involved, it, was, it helped keep the commercial fishing industry located here in Sheboygan from having to move someplace else where they could bring their boats in. So we have benefits for the folks who use the river, um, who have businesses along the river, who recreate in the river, and those just who enjoy the outdoors. From lake surfing to broads, then an EPA area of concern. Sheboygan is changing its identity yet again. It will now be celebrated as a shining example of how environmental action can kickstart a local economy, leading the way for the other Great Lakes areas of concern. There are 43 areas of concern that exist in the Great Lakes, and only two of them have been delisted or removed from that uh, AOC designation. Other areas are asking, how did you do it? How did you put it together? Well, it was good municipal cooperation. The restoration of the Sheboygan River has really been an excellent example of how people can work together and really make a difference in their community. People at all levels, people at the federal level, people at the state level, people at the local level. It's just amazing what a group of people can do when they get together and put their mind to a single goal. So back to the question of why are we here today talking about ecosystem services and the link to social and cultural and economic well-being. 
Um, I think a lot of us are aware of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. It was originally appropriated at over $300 million. Um, the original full appropriation has been reduced to an undetermined lower amount. At this point, EPA just put out a call uh, to award about $9.5 million. We're really not sure what, you know, what that amount is going to equal to in the end. But can any of you expand on the ramifications of what it means to the work that you're doing right now or how it may support the work that you're doing right now? Um, how, how, is, how is GLRI affecting the work that you do, Heather? Yeah, so I guess it's um, important to mention is this isn't the first cut that we've experienced under the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, it's the, probably the most significant anticipated cut to date. Um, and so it's sort of the death by a thousand cuts. When we see these types of budget rescissions or reductions, it actually impacts and degrades the, the overall effectiveness of the entire program as a whole. Um, from a NOAA perspective, you know, what I'd like to share with folks uh, is that 95% of our GLRI coastal funding that comes in goes right back out to local communities and partners. And so, you know, the impact isn't only felt by the federal agencies, it's felt all the way from the federal down to the local government and, and execution scales. So um, from that perspective, I, I think what's being discussed right now is a very significant potential impact to our ability to make a difference on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, many of the areas of concern that we are working very steadily to try to delist in the Great Lakes region are, um, are very expensive to, to delist. Mm -hmm. And so um, Superfund sites are a great example of the scale of, of um, dollar coverage that would take to, to actually get these areas delisted. So I think it's important to note that and you know in terms of um, impacts back to local businesses and things of that nature, you know we work really closely with local cities and um, a good example is we've been investing quite a bit from a coastal perspective at looking at water levels and what are the impacts to coastal communities and what happens with severe storms and things in that nature. Um, you know, the Great Lakes harbors, you know, no pun on the word there, but we harbor some of the most significant ports in the U.S. Um, from a commercial shipping perspective. And so when we have impacts to our Great Lakes, when we have um, significant climate change that results perhaps in highly variable water, water levels, that impacts our commercial shipping industry's ability to get out and, and do business as they would like to, to mm -hmm. do business. Um, so knowing more about and investing in some research so that we understand what the baselines and how much is changing over time, those are important investments for our future and, and being able to forecast what impacts will be over the long term. Mm -hmm. What about, um, you know, from a private industry perspective, John, how, do you, how would you, are you impacted by these cuts? Yeah, absolutely. You talked about the GLRI funds filtering down to local businesses and, and, and uh, governments. The, you saw in the, the video, on the forest video, that uh, the two-hearted um, watershed that we uh, had inventoried all the road stream crossings and through a partnership of, of private funding and donors as well as a big chunk of GLRI money, we were able to, we just got our last little piece of funding to fix every road stream crossing in that watershed. And that work was done by local contractors, local excavators, you know, my company had a big hand in that. So those GLRI funds have been a big part of our business model for the last couple of years. Um, I think, you know, the, the, you take a, a watershed like the, the Two-Hearted, or we just saw that uh, video on, on Sheboygan. Um, if you can get people focused around an idea that if we can fix this, then our quality of life will be better, then you need to look at local governments, local agencies, and other agencies to help fund those important projects when people realize that this is to the, the public benefit. Right. Because we can't always go to GLRI or some of these places to, to fund these projects. I think that the, the cuts are probably going to continue for the foreseeable well, And it was never intended to be a long-term right. funding yeah, solution. It was intended to be about four years. And it's catalyzed great work throughout the Great Lakes Basin, a, a lot that I, probably all of us here are, are benefiting from right now in one way or another, whether it's through the work that we're being funded or, or quality of life that we're experiencing because of it. Um, so, so what's next? I mean, I, this is the focus of the next panel that we'll hear, but how do we all, businesses, communities, conservation, come up with some innovative um, solutions to start thinking about these win-win these win-win opportunities. Well, I think, you know, one of the great things about the direction we've moved in in thinking about um, systems, both nature and people, as part of a system, 
is then drawing the links between actions in some place and benefits someplace else. So the science of actually making those links, how important is it, how does this affect people's well-being and livelihoods, um, and then bringing in whether it's uh, um, a company or an agency or a public-private partnership, like on those water fund examples where you're actually bringing together the people who benefit from something with the people whose actions affect, affect those benefits. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of good examples. So the water funds is, is, is one good example. Um, in, the, uh, in, in forestry, there are now, um, and in agriculture, there are people who are bundling together uh, like carbon benefits. And, and so if I maintain my forest, I can now get some payment for carbon. So those kinds of ideas, and it's not strictly government. Government has a role. It's not strictly private, but certainly private has a role. But these partnerships that try to bring together the beneficiaries of actions with the, with the landowners and others who, whose actions affect them. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think the partnerships thing is a, is a great idea. And when you look at within cities and urban uh, re revitalization, you also have partnerships with kind of community development coalitions. And if you get the community involved, uh, sometimes the best ideas come from the people that live there and the people that you know know this area and have lived with this area, have lived with the forests and the coastal regions. Uh, so really getting the community involved as part of that partnership uh, can really help. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, you know, another good example is actually here in the great state of Michigan where the Michigan Coastal Program has actually um, submitted 10 different um, community grants out to actually help with the establishment uh, planning, mapping, and marketing a water trail across the coastline and, and in the near shore of, of the Michigan uh, Great Lakes Coast. You know, that's a tremendous asset. It builds in that public-private partnership it um, redirects federal monies to be able to leverage, you know, rubbing the nickels together and make those dollars go a little bit further. And it's doing a great service to the community because it's actually encouraging them to get out and experience the great investment in nature that we're all making together. So, so if there was um, kind of a one thing that, that you wanted viewers of this panel discussion to walk away with an idea, something they could do, a piece of, of information to take forward. Any, any final thoughts from folks? Well, I'll throw in one, which is so uh, I started out, you know, I was in economics, but I've always had an interest in the environment. And, you know, at the beginning there was some tensions like, well, you're either on the environment side or the economic side. I think th the point here is this is all one thing, mm -hmm. right? So we're doing good investments in conservation maybe for its own sake, but also importantly for people's sake, for, for well-being, as we've talked it through a number of these examples. Yeah, and I'll kind of piggyback on that, you know, from the economic point. Uh, so we actually in Cleveland had a Cuyahoga River fire that happened uh, a number of decades ago. And a congressman, Lewis Stokes, had a very good quote, I'm going to paraphrase, but basically said one of the most devastating impacts of this are the perception of Cleveland it made. It didn't you know, portray it as this progressive, productive city that, it, that he really viewed it was at the time. And that perception can have long-run impacts, economic impacts, where people view the city poorly and don't want to move to that area and don't view it. Uh, but it also has a positive impact that we can change that. Uh, the Cuyahoga is now a national park. Uh, people go there, you know, there's lots of hiking and biking trails and people enjoy that park every day. So we can turn it around. But we really need to look at the long term, and it has long term environmental impacts as well as long term economic impacts that are important uh, to everyone in the community, all businesses, all residents. It's interesting. Steve said he started in economics and now he, you know, thinks about biological systems. I started in forestry and I spend as much time thinking about economics now. So I think there's probably that relation, and the one take home message would be that all these systems, whether it's forests or coastal watersheds and all these things, are interrelated, and that if we're concerned about protecting our economy, protecting our way of life, then you need to think about the northern forest you may not live there. You need to think about the coastline you may not live on the coast. But all of these things are so closely related that we can't think about any one thing by itself. Yeah, and I guess my, my final thought on this is that win-win um, solutions sell themselves. Uh, they just make economic and environmental sense. And so um, just encourage folks to get out and experience nature uh, firsthand because I think then they might find that they have some they may discover some unique values that they themselves have and that they can pass on to their future generations and actively look for ways to do that. We have a few minutes for um, some questions from the audience. First question, please. 
Hi there, good morning. Uh, my name is Hugh McDermott and I'm with the Michigan Environmental Council. And it's really exciting and heartening to hear uh, this discussion of the economic value of our natural resources. Um, things like how uh, billions of dollars in new infrastructure was avoided by protecting the uh, Catskills watershed in New York. Um, the value of wetlands uh, in flood protection and water quality and how we can reduce our infrastructure costs um, and those sorts of things. Shade trees reducing air conditioning. Um, and this is a great discussion. Unfortunately, it seems like the, the, uh, the science and, and the research is well ahead of our public policy um, discussions and our politicians. Uh, in Lansing and in Washington, D.C., we rarely see these economic um, values of natural resources factored into public policy debates. Um, I don't know whether the politicians don't understand this um, or don't care, but my question to you all is how do we, how do we move discussions like this one onto the floor of the House and the Senate and committee rooms where they can make a real uh, difference in the big picture? Uh, I can think of one example that we talked about when we were talking about forests before this segment. Um, you look at Michigan, there's a $12 billion direct tie to the forest products industry. That's everything from harvesting trees to trucking those trees to the mill and, and then turning that into a product. When you look at Wisconsin, they have a similar acreage of forest land, 16 million acres of forest land in Wisconsin, 17 million in Michigan. They have a $20 billion stimulus to the economy. So the question is, well, what's the difference? Are they cutting more trees? Are they what's happening and, and what it is is it's secondary processing so what Wisconsin has done partially is they've kept a lot of those products in the state and then they've manufactured goods out of those products and that's where the real value add is so again there's a lot of discussion on harvest levels in the state of Michigan and are we cutting enough timber and my answer to that would be well, there may be more resource that we could utilize but we need to think about how we're going to use it after we after we harvest that tree can we encourage uh, sustainable industry certified products and those kind of things so i think there's it's you know you can't just look at one aspect you need to look at the whole industry i think i think policymakers often have the incentive to look at short term and that's really the biggest problem and so what we have to do and oftentimes uh they don't want to you know tackle these upfront costs even though there's long-run savings and what we have to do is because I think they think their residents and their voters won't understand, but I don't think that's right. I think they will. I think if policymakers are upfront with their voters and say, there's an upfront cost to whatever this ecosystem service is, but look at there's a long run benefits and really be honest about it. I think that their voters will see that, yes, in the short run, there'll be costs, but in the long run, it will be better. And a lot of that is holding policymakers accountable in the long run. And that's hard to do. And a lot of that's up to us and up to the media to make sure that we don't just look at the short term, that we follow up on what these policymakers are doing. Yeah, and I just one final comment on that question. I think um, with regard to trying to get it into the public arena and on the Hill, is, as you described, um, part of the onus is on us uh, in communicating that information and, and really translating it into something that's actually actionable. Um, how the terminology that we use sometimes may not be the most appropriate terminology to actually convey the message that we want to, to send. So it may be something uh, translated into a, a, a cost from a dollar perspective. If we're talking with corporations and businesses, it might be looking at cost avoidance or cost efficiencies gained. Um, either way, we need to do a better job of knowing who our audiences are and trying to convey to them what these uh, economic values are in meaningful terms. One more question. I'm Greg Norwood with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm a wildlife biologist at uh, Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. We uh, have uh, many projects, GLRI included, invasive species, etc. What are the specific features um, uh, that, that can make an ecosystem restoration rehabilitation project uh, most relevant to an increasingly more urban, uh, suburban population and really inspire the next generation uh, of of uh, conservationists? I think a lot of that comes to uh, open spaces. Uh, so making sure there's open space. And a lot of that actually comes down to kids, having parks for kids and open spaces, forest trails for kids to enjoy. Uh, when they enjoy these open spaces early, then they're more likely to stay in that area, which helps the urban area. Um, it also helps for just relationships. Part of quality of life is uh, not only the recreation that we uh, get to enjoy, but also, you know, the time we spend with our family. And if we can spend that time with our family on lakes and on rivers and on hiking trails and enjoy that, uh, then that really impacts that city and impacts the regional growth in that city uh, and helps the urban area. I'll follow up on that. So one of the things here, I mean, that we've been trying to make the, the case of sort of tying through links from actions all the way through to how does this affect people? 
So one of the things I would think about in any conservation project or restoration project is in what ways are, uh, is this going to have important impacts that, that people uh, will care about. So, you know, the recreation, the open space is certainly one of them. Uh, you know, is this affecting water quality in some important way? Is it affecting fish uh, that, that uh, is, you know, is an important fishery or, or recreational site? Um, so, you know, how can I think about how this project affects how the system operates and affects, affects people? And one of the, I think the really, uh, you know, the, the question about politics was maybe uh, somewhat, uh, you know, pessimistic, but, but, you know, this, I actually see that uh, this language is now starting to become more mainstream. So companies are thinking about that. Even uh, the federal government is thinking about this. Maybe not, uh, you know, congressional hearings as much, but, but agencies certainly are talking about ecosystem services and how do they fold this into their operation. So, you know, in the restoration project, what is it doing? How is it affecting the system? And how does that affect the people who, who depend on that system? Thank you. And thanks, thanks to you all. Um, it's been a great conversation. Appreciate your time. And now back to Christy. All right, thanks so much, Catherine. And you are watching Great Lakes Now Connect, a program created by Detroit Public Television and the Nature Conservancy to focus on issues facing the Great Lakes. And today we're talking about investing in nature. Our second panel is coming up in just a few minutes, but if you've just joined us and want to learn more about the conversation, just go to our website at greatlakesnow.org. Joining me now to talk about assessing the lakes is John Nevin. He's a spokesman for the International Joint Commission. John, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, very happy to be here, Christy. Why don't you first of all talk about the role of the IJC in keeping the Great Lakes clean and in your role in encouraging public opinion as well. Sure. Our, our commission was created by a treaty a hundred years ago. It was kind of the brainchild of, of Teddy Roosevelt. I think a lot of folks are familiar with his commitment to mm -hmm. the environment. And uh, it allows the U.S. and Canada to work together to preserve not just the Great Lakes but waters from coast to coast. And our main mission is, is uh, twofold. We, we bring scientists together from both countries to make recommendations to the governments and we take the politics out of it. But secondly, and, and even uh, just as is important is to bring people to the table so that we, we engage the public, let them know what the scientists say, let them know what kind of recommendations are important to cleaning up the lakes, and get the public involved and invested in, in Great Lakes protection. Is it hard to keep the politics out of it? Uh, you know, it's actually, it's not that hard. Somet sometimes, you know, if, if people are concerned about the lakes, it's easy to put the Republican and Democrat label aside and say, we're all for the Great Lakes. We're all for the Great Lakes, but sometimes that funding and where the funding comes from and convincing people yeah. that the funding is necessary gets a little political, would you say? Oh, sure. It, it definitely gets political. A lot of times uh, there's this um, dichotomy between folks saying, well, gee, uh, we need to sacrifice the environment to help the economy, that we can't have environmental protection and economic growth. And that's just not the case. And we need to, to really prove to the public that we can have both environmental protection, a clean environment, and a healthy economy. In fact, we have to have both. All right, so coming up next month is Great Lakes Week. It is in Milwaukee yes. this year, and it is the first time that you're going to be having some public hearings since the new right. Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. What are you expecting to hear from the public? Uh, we'll hear a, a lot of concerns from the public. Uh, we'll, he we'll hear about uh, concerns about uh, uh, Asian carp is a big one. Uh, we're going to be hearing about concerns on Lake Erie because of the issue of uh, harmful algae and the nutrient runoff from farms. Uh, we're going to he hear from uh, people who are concerned about uh, uh, nuclear waste in the Great Lakes. I mean, that's I just got a call yesterday from uh, some constituents who are really worried about nuclear waste that's stored along the Great Lakes. You know, part of your job is trying to get the public engaged mm -hmm. on what's happening with the Great Lakes issues and, and the part that the IJC plays in all of yeah. this. Do you feel that people sometimes still struggle with what can I do to, mm -hmm. to make a difference and how would you convince them that yes you can? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, we, we brought some uh, school kids from Detroit down to the to the riverfront for, a, for a, a festival and we found out that half of them had never been to the Detroit River. So there's a lot of people out there who just aren't connected to the lakes, whether you live in Detroit or live in, you know, in, in Brighton or in, in, in East Lansing. And you know, there's a reason that we call them the Great Lakes. They're not the average lakes. And if we want to have Great Lakes, we have to invest in, in Great Lakes. We, want to, we need more people to be involved in cleaning them, them up and protecting them. I mean, so the education process yeah, obviously exactly. is very important and it's probably been much better than it has been 10 mm -hmm. years ago, but you still have a lot of work to do. We do, and uh, it's it's making that connection with people, not just in understanding that you know, it's important where they live, but it's important to our region as a whole. Uh, there are you know investments in uh, in shorefront cleanups. There are investments in uh, restoring 
uh, you know, beaches and, uh, and wetlands. They help clean up the waters, but they also help property values. And that, that's really important to folks. IJC, obviously, a binational with, mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. Canada and with the United States. Do you find that Canada has a, a similar approach to Great Lakes conservation that the United States does? Uh, yes, they do. I mean, we, we have conversations all the time with uh, Canadian officials and U.S. officials at the table. Uh, sometimes we have, you know, different approaches in terms of regulation, but we all have the same goals in mind. And we have really great cooperation, especially with the new water quality agreement. Uh, both countries are, are really working hard to try to, to uh, kind of speed up the cleanup. All right. Well, we're looking forward to hearing from the commissioners and the IJC at Great Lakes Week mm -hmm. coming up next month in Milwaukee. We look forward to seeing you there, John. Perfect. Look okay. forward to seeing you. All right. We appreciate it. Our thanks to John Nevin from the IJC for joining us. You know, the Great Lakes are a natural resource, but they are also a huge economic tool for many cities along the water. We've talked about this. It's called a blue economy. Take a look. Reduce, reuse, recycle, the motto of the green movement. We've got our heads around the fact that there's a green economy meaning a lot of money and new products to be made that are energy conservation oriented and uh, certainly uh, a lifestyle choice. But now another color may just be the way the Great Lakes region can bank on our water. We're talking about the blue economy. The blue economy is a catch-all for the ways water matters to our economic growth by both marking us as a community and a region in our Great Lakes case that is uh, celebrating and enjoying and special and attractive because of our water assets. Special indeed, the Great Lakes contains 20% of the world's surface fresh water. But the blue economy is more than just creating tourist attractions. There's a lot of serious economics that go along with it. Perhaps the best way to think about the blue economy is to break it into four simple categories. Water as a, um, as a place definer, you know, being on the water, access to water, clean water in your community for all the enjoyment and quality of life benefits is, is certainly a major one. Water as a new growing uh, business opportunity, clean water, water monitoring, water measuring, water treating, using water smarter. There is also tremendous water, research learning, problem solving, being the center of excellence at our great universities, the lifestyle and values. Um, again, people want to make a lifestyle decision to use water smarter and help save the planet. Several cities, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Duluth, and even Macomb County in Michigan have already capitalized on this blue economy. Every dollar that we invest in Great Lakes restoration has a three to one payoff in terms of the long-term economic growth development uh, from making the water available and, and all the increased um, uh, value. A value not just counted in dollars and cents. Portland is known for sustainability. San Francisco is known for being green. The blue economy could bring that kind of new identity to the more than 30 million people in the Great Lakes Basin. People want to make a lifestyle decision to use water smarter and help save the planet. They want to choose products. They want to be in communities that are involved in sustainable work and living. And they want to be involved in sustainable practices in their everyday lives. So the communities that are all about that, that are all about using water sustainably and having a, being good stewards of the planet, ha create a buzz in an environment that people want to choose to participate in. And it's an interesting look at what economic boost the lakes can provide. At the core, the lakes provide essentials to millions, water and food. A big factor is making sure that the great catch that people reel in is actually safe to eat. Joining me now is Donna Kajian, assistant professor at Wayne State University in biological sciences. Dr. Kajian, thanks so much for joining me. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about what kind of contaminants can we find in the Great Lakes and in the Detroit River when people are, are there fishing to sustain? Well, right now in the Great Lakes, we do monitor for certain contaminants, and I think there's probably a plethora or more of different contaminants that we may not be um, monitoring for, like emerging contaminants, pharmaceuticals, and whatnot. But the main ones that people are concerned about are things like um, mercury, dioxins, and PCBs. And those are the ones that there are fish advisories on in, in the Great Lakes. 
what fish are maybe more susceptible to picking up those contaminants? Well, in general, it is. It's not. It, it depends on the fish itself. Um, the larger, longer-lived fish, the ones with more fat, are the ones that are going to have more contaminants. So some of your smaller fish, like yellow perch, are going to have lower contaminants and are actually are quite healthy to eat. And so they're high in protein and omega-3 fatty acids. So there's the message of fish are good to eat, but we still have fish with high contaminant loads. So what kind of impact can that have on people's health? What specific illnesses are we looking at? Well, well, these are long-term things, and these are some of the problems with warning people about this because they, people will say things like, oh, I've eaten fish my whole life and nothing's happened to me. Well, but some of these are long-term cancer and neurological effects that don't develop, you know, immediately after eating a fish. So it's very hard for some people to understand um, that these can have long-term effects, and some of these mainly are cancer. I think an interesting thing to think about is also the impact that we have on, on health care as well. When you have people who are eating the fish, and this is something that they're counting on for, for their food, and they can get sick like this, what is the impact on then maybe passing along a health care bill to people who live in Michigan and around the, around the Great Lakes Basin that we have to pay for the care? Yeah, and I, I wanted to bring up too that you, you brought up an interesting thing in passing along. It's also passing along to unborn children. So it's the advisories are also on um, on on those specific, expected yes, mothers, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, you know, and the cost thing is a very difficult thing to handle because of the effects may not be immediate. So it's a very hard. I think politically, it's a very very hard thing to use to utilize and pass and deal with. So talk to me about I mean, how many people are we looking at, do you think, in the Great Lakes Basin? There are pockets of people that really count on the Great Lakes for their food supply. Yeah, and for myself, I work at Wayne State University, which is in Detroit, and so a lot of my research focuses on some of the connecting channels of the Great Lakes, which is the Detroit River. And then Detroit does have a larger population of African Americans. It has a larger population of um, people of lower income, and we are learning a lot of those um, individuals do fish the Detroit River and depending that, depend on that fish for sustenance. And a lot of them actually just trade them for other foods in the community. So we're seeing we're a, a lot, lot of fish distributed in the community that I think we weren't aware of historically. And it is very important to a lot of different groups, in addition to just recreational fish, fish anglers taking them home and sharing them with their family. So quite a few. And so what is your, uh, what are you working on right now in terms of looking down the road at other possible contaminants that you were mentioning that we need to look out for? Well, uh, I think we really need to be looking at the top, the emerging contaminants, the pharmaceuticals. There are no regulations in place for them right now. We know they're passed through the human bodies. They go into the wastewater treatment. They end up in the waterways. We don't know if they have an effect. I, it's, we don't want to say, oh, they do. They, they are detected in the water. We just don't know their long-term effect with us continuously consuming them in our drinking water and our fish. Bottom line, um, what is the education process to make sure that you are reaching those anglers who are who are using those fish and, and to sustain? Well, for myself and a group along the Detroit River, we are um, working with different agencies and um, nonprofit organizations to communicate. We have river walkers, so we've hired people from the Detroit area to actually walk up and down the river talking to anglers, distributing information to them, and then advertising where to find the information. And we are also working um, doing bio monitoring projects, trying to get, get a um, very broad um, information out. We have signs posted up and down the rivers of what fish are good to eat, which have higher contaminant loads. So really trying a broad approach to, to reach the community as opposed to just having an advisory, and now it's called a guide to eating safe fish. All right, education is the yeah. key. Thank you so much, Dr. Donna Cashin, for joining me. We are going to continue now with our second panel discussion. They will focus on examples of natural investments and how we can do that to protect our future. Our moderator is Dr. Patrick Doran, the Director of Conservation Programs at the Nature Conservancy. Patrick? Thanks, Christy. Uh, it's great to be here today with everybody. We have a couple goals today. In the first um, panel, we really talked about the services that people get from nature. We talked about forests, we talked about coastal systems, we talked about urban environments. And our goal today for the second panel is to really dive deep and look at some very specific examples in those systems. So here with me today to help me do that is um, John Allen. He's with the state of Michigan, where he's the director of the Office of Great Lakes. Skiles Boy, he's with DT Energy, where he's Vice President of uh, Sustainability and Environmental Affairs. Um, Kent Gilgus, he's uh, with Managing Director with Conservation Forestry, talk about some forest issues. And Kevin Schaefer, who's the Executive Director of the Milwaukee, Wisconsin Metropolitan Sewage District. So thanks everybody for being here today, and I'm looking forward to kind of this next hour in this conversation. Um, one thing we ended up with at the end of that last panel was this idea that Steve Glasky put forth is that 
we're really beginning to mainstream the idea of, of nature's benefits and ecosystem services. It's not just in the realm of, of the conservation realm, but we see it across all aspects, again, from investments we see in forestry to investments in, in green and blue infrastructure in cities to the operations of major corporations throughout the region. So how have you seen this kind of change? Have you observed this change over the past decade or so about this mainstream, John? A couple of things come to mind. I, we touched on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative before, recognizing that there's a, a large economic drag that continues through the system from practices of the past. What we did to sediments, how we pulled so much wealth out so fast and didn't attend to the, sort of the function of the system. And just the GLRI recognizes the need to clear that drag. It's really focusing on the R, or that restoration side, to make sure that we understand how we're really recreating value. So I think that that's one way we've seen that mainstream come back in. And another, on the corporate side, we see a very strong emphasis uh, growing on corporate sustainability and how corporate sustainability is seeing the recognition of those, those, those co-occurring values, mm -hmm. not competing values, but those values as they work together. So I think there's a couple of right. examples from different areas. So it seems to me this, this um we, we can do a lot of reading, we can look a lot of the news, and we hear a lot about GLRI and the Restoration Initiative and, and politics, but it seems to me the idea of nature's benefits and ecosystem services almost blows up our reliance upon the government support and expands our investments to all sectors of society. Are, are you seeing that, Kent? Uh, I think in the investment side of the um, equation where we work, uh, what we're seeing is uh, a whole growth of investors that are interested in what, what some people call impact investing or some people call ESG, environmental social governance. It's sort of this corporate social responsibility. They're looking for investments that are achieving multiple benefits. They need the return. They need to know that they're going to get their money back and they're going to get uh, some uh, economic value, but they're looking for something beyond that as well. Right. So let's dive deep, and I think our job here is going to be actually dive deep in some of these very specific examples in our various sectors that we work in. Um, in the first panel, we heard from John Fosgit um, about the values that forests provide for society. And I think, Ken, we've talked before, and a big question is, is how do we keep forests as forests to ensure that they are providing those whole set of values from the conservation benefits and the species and the plants and the animals to the recreational benefits to the um, driving the economy benefits. So how do we keep or how do you think about in, in, in with conservation and forestry, how do you think about how do we keep forests as forests? Sure. Well, I mean, I think Steve said it very well in the first panel uh, that the intermingling of economics and uh, conservation are essential that if, if we think about trying to protect forests and we aren't thinking about the economic uses of those forests, then the forest won't remain forests. And so our business was set up specifically to invest in timberland where we can generate returns to investors but manage it sustainably. And so the type of stuff that John was talking about I think is critical to long-term forest conservation because in the end there isn't enough government money or philanthropic money to protect all the things we want to protect. So we've really got to focus on strategies that are just maintaining trees on the ground in good management. So um, John, we have a state here in Michigan who, who owns a lot of forest land. Do you see them thinking like this and, and thinking about how else or what kind of outcomes we're trying to get from our forested systems? I think the state's always looking to find that balance. How, how do you balance production and productivity and timbering and timber harvest with a whole suite of values that, that people in Michigan want. And that's to be able to look at the forest, to be able to recreate in the forest, to be able to snowmobile and to ski through the forest and, and the benefits that that forest gives in terms of absorbing water, absorbing carbon, all those other benefits that the previous panel talked about. Mm -hmm. Those are all compelling pieces. And, and we, we want to look at that as an and proposition, not an or proposition. And that does take, there's complications in those trade-offs. Right. Some people may want, you know, all extraction all the time or a lot more extraction faster than that forest can produce. But we have to find what that balance looks like. Right. So I do see uh, our, our Department of Natural Resources and our partners and our private partners as well really looking to understand how this happens. We saw pictures before what happens when you just cut everything really quickly. Right? And, and there was a lot of consequence to that. There was a lot of wealth created, but there was a lot of consequence in the short term. Mm -hmm. And we're really still understanding and clearing the consequence of that 
action, and we don't want to do that again. So, Ken, getting back specifically some some very specific forest conservation, I mean, John's talking about these long-term changes we see in forest, but we see changes today that are kind of barriers to getting those benefits. We see changes in land ownership and changes in land tenure. What are some of the, what do some of those patterns look like, and how are they affecting our ability to keep those forest systems operating? Well, one one of the biggest changes uh, in the last that occurred over the last ten or fifteen years is that. Uh, Land, a lot of the industrial timber land in the U.S. was owned by what we call vertically integrated companies. So the International Papers or the Georgia Pacifics, the, the, and they had factories that manufactured paper or whatever out of those forest products. Uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, most of that land was sold, driven by Wall Street concerns, uh, and it's now owned by timber investment management organizations. And the investors in those are pension funds and uh, high net worth individuals and endowments. So uh, a lot of our investors are teachers, firemen, policemen. Uh, and what we're uh, obligated to do is to try to maintain value for them over the long term. But they also want to know that what we're generating is good conservation outcomes, protected land, strong, you know, and high quality water. And streams. So, can you take us to a specific example in yeah, the Great Lakes? I mean, some investments. A good example uh, we were involved in. We acquired uh, 69,000 acres in called the Goodman Forest in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's up right near Iron Mountain. Okay. Uh, and uh, we worked in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and uh, with the state of Wisconsin. Uh, Governor Doyle at that time in Wisconsin really wanted to protect this because it was in between uh, a state forest and national forest and it had two very high quality rivers running through it. And so we worked with Governor Doyle uh, and, uh, and Governor Doyle ended up acquiring 5,000 acres along those rivers, turned them into permanently protected wild and scenic rivers, and then put an easement, a conservation easement that restricted development on the rest of, or on most of that acreage. And so in the end, out of a 69,000 acre forest, 65,000 acres were permanently protected. Mm -hmm. uh, they're ensuring that that will be forest forever. Uh, but they're also maintaining products into the local mills. They're staying on the tax rolls and they're open to public access mm -hmm. for recreation. And so you look for those values. Go ahead, Kevin. I was going to say, you know, we talk about forests, but we also need to think about how we drive the message home. We always right. talk about forests in the Upper Peninsula or northern Wisconsin. Um, a lot of my constituents in Milwaukee have never seen Lake Michigan. They've never been to a forest. Yeah. So I think we need to also drive the message to the urban core as well. We need to bring people back to nature in, in these urban centers. Urban forests themselves are a big piece that uh, helps with that. The green infrastructure that was discussed in the previous panel, just reconnecting the population centers with nature mm -hmm. so that they can see the benefits in their backyard and then they can see them up uh, around the Great Lakes and around the country as well. Yeah, it seems like that theme of connectedness both both locally but trying to connect people to maybe a resource that's miles away. Now, when you get back to those investors, you said, you know, those, those, those policemen, those fire, those, those, those teachers, they're, they could be anywhere <laughs> in the United States, anywhere in the world. Do they see that value? Do they see themselves as contributing back to the value of, of this greater resource? I think they absolutely do. They want to know that their dollars are being invested in a way that's not destroying things. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, as most investors in most companies do, I mean, DT is a great example. They're, they're managing a company, but they're also creating great environmental outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, so uh, th thanks for that example. I mean, it seems to me there's a few lessons to learn about what the kind of qualities you look for or the situations or the win-win or the characteristics of these projects you look for. And do you, do you see some of those guys, and we're going to dive into coastal here in just a second, but do you see some overarching patterns of the types of qualities you look for in a project when you choose to invest? Sure, and, and I think uh, it really works with great partnerships. Yeah. Um, we, we found that we can't do much of anything ourselves. And uh, so we've looked hard at the forestry and reforestation as related to climate change. And uh, you know, the previous panel raised that issue. And so we've made huge investments, uh, I mean, huge millions of dollars, That's um, <laughs> in the sense of uh, implanted a lot of forests both here in Michigan and in the lower Mississippi Delta where trees grow faster. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they've always been with Nature Conservancy or Conservation Fund. 
uh, then the property is then turned over to the Fish and Wildlife Service right. to manage. And so it's, it only works with those kind of partnerships. And so we look for projects that put all those things together and those are our best ones to make the investments in. So let's transition. I think we have a video coming up that talks about, I think, those two themes, that connectedness and those partnerships and those public and private investments. And we have a video coming up that shows a, a major coastal restoration happening here in the Great Lakes. Um, the focus is on Erie Marsh, just north of Toledo. My name is Paul Pachowski, and uh, I'm a charter boat captain out on Lake Erie. I go out fishing every day. I love to fish. I love to be on the water. I'm not a happy person unless I can see or touch the water. It's impossible to separate fishing from the culture and economy of the Great Lakes, especially for those like Captain Paul, who make a living taking anglers onto Lake Erie. But declines in fish populations have made it harder and harder to catch the limit. Back when I started this 30 years ago, Anybody could go out there and catch their walleyes, just throw a lure over the side of the boat, put the rod over your shoulder, don't even pay attention, and the rod will jerk down and you'd reel up a fish. Now, in order to get your fish, you gotta be pretty much on your game. Key to getting fish numbers up in Western Lake Erie is restoring coastal wetlands. Over the decades, we've traded coastal development for habitat to the detriment of our economy and recreation. These days, 11% of all remaining wetlands in southeast Michigan are contained in the Nature Conservancy's Erie Marsh Preserve. So it's here that a major project is underway to restore what little habitat remains to maximize the benefit for all. Coastal wetlands provide some storm dampening uh, capacity, flood control. They filter water and water that flows through them actually comes out cleaner once it's been through a wetland. So they provide clean water, they provide clean air, and they provide habitat for fish and wildlife. Earthen dikes built more than 70 years ago disconnected the marsh from Lake Erie. The site is being re-engineered to re-establish that connection. The purpose of the water control structure is to allow uh, fish access into the marsh to provide additional spawning opportunity. And the fish passage structure will allow them free access to come and go and, and do their thing. Coming into the preserve, into the diked wetland, there's more vegetation available. It provides a protected area from both predators and from natural environment, meaning high winds and wave energy that can uh, harm some eggs or young fish. So it provides uh, foraging habitat, just a protected uh, site for fish to use. Another obstacle to restoring fish habitat at Erie Marsh is Phragmites, a plant that's familiar to most. You're likely to see it growing on the sides of roads and highways. But even though we see Phragmites at every turn, it's not a native species. Like Asian carp, it's an invader to the Great Lakes. And at Erie Marsh, Phragmites has room to take over. Growing so densely, it creates a green wall literally forcing out all other life. This in turn forces site managers to go to great lengths to eradicate this pernicious plant. We're spraying with herbicide, then we're either mowing or burning to get rid of the standing dead plant material. And then the key component is really to flood those areas. And the new pumps and water control structure and distribution canal will allow us to flood all the areas that are invaded by Phragmites up to about two or three feet, really drown them out to make sure they're dead. And then when we draw that water down, um, there's native species in the seed bank and those will spring right up. The rarity and importance of coastal wetland habitat to the Great Lakes sparked a $2.5 million investment into this site by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Given that Erie Marsh represents the 11% of wetlands in southeast Michigan, and as such is one of the largest left on the Lake Erie shoreline, we thought it would have significant uh, benefits to restoring this area. These kind of habitats can bounce back really fast. The habitat response is almost immediate. I've seen projects where we're under construction and water comes in a rainstorm and the birds are already there. With a little bit of investment at this point, we can really get a big bang for our buck and these areas just need a little push in the right direction before they spring back and uh, they regain some of their historical uh, quality and benefits. And for lifelong fishermen of Lake Erie like Captain Paul, that can't come soon enough. Lake Erie only has 2% of the water. 
but it produces 50% of the fish for human consumption that come out of the Great Lakes. That's a big number, and that's why this, this area is so important to not just protect, but to help flourish. Thanks a lot, that was a, a great video. Um, if I step back and if I just put completely my conservation lenses on and just think about conservation, Erie Marsh is a no-brainer to me, right? It's a great place for migratory birds, migratory waterfowl, shorebirds, um, spawning areas, it's a beautiful place, beautiful sunsets. But I also know that we, we mentioned a, a investment, a federal investment of over $2 million, approaching $3 million in the restoration. But I also know that some of our major corporations um, have invested in DT, and, and specifically Skiles, um, DT um, Energy has invested in, in the restoration of Erie Marsh. And, and thinking about Erie Marsh in the whole context of a, of a coastal system throughout Western Lake Erie. So why, why? Why would a corporation like DTE Energy invest in these types of restorations and this type of conservation vision? Well, basically there's two reasons. And the, the first one is broad and, uh, you know, we're a, a gas and electric utility that's located here in the Great Lakes. And all of our employees are located here in the Great Lakes. And we want to attract businesses to come into the area. And so all those things, our employees are you know, they, they hunt, they fish, they, they enjoy the nature. Uh, they want us to do the right thing as a corporation in order to feel part of that. Um, our, we, we want more businesses to move into the area. We can't go other places. Yeah, I think Amanda mentioned that in the first panel about this, this quality of life quality side of, of life, things. Absolutely, and, and so, you know, Michigan is fantastic in the resources that we have and the potential that we have to attract people. And so that's very important. So, you know, that's kind of the broader sense of it. So we do a lot of investment through our foundation. Mm -hmm. I think if you think about the last year or so, we've spent about a million and a half dollars, roughly spread over, you know, 30, 35 different organizations to partner with again. Um, but to, to help that broad sense. In addition to that, um, you know, there are individual specific issues that are important to us. Um, you know, as, uh, as the environmental guys, sometimes we have to protect our facilities from the environment. And there's invasive species and things like that that, that we're, we're interested in taking care of. And, um, so do you see specific implications or impacts of things like Phragmites or oh, zebra absolutely. mussels on your facilities and operations? Absolutely, and that's part of why we, right. you know, uh, have partnered with you and, and others to try to remove uh, some of that. It goes all the way to security. We have a nuclear power plant, right. and you know, to, to keep the Phragmites down in that surrounding area is important. So you have a view just for that. Side, yeah. And uh, so it goes, it's, it's very broad. Uh, climate, again, is another issue that we've invested heavily because we're trying to figure out ways that we can address the issue, address it as people want us to, and, and do it in a low cost manner to our, our investors. Yeah, John. I, I, was, I, want, I want to pick up on this theme of connection because uh, I think this is really critical. We've talked about connecting or reconnecting natural systems, rivers that flow, mm -hmm. but we've also really focusing on how people connect to those resources. So we've seen efforts at the federal level under JLRI, we've seen efforts on the state through state management plans, through timber management plans with our DNR and the management of state lands. But, but, but what I wanted to also mention is, I travel around the state a lot, and, and I see community after community expressing their desire and their hope through just an inordinate amount of personal effort at the community level. We see this in Monroe and in the, in, in the River Raisin system. We see this in Muskegon. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to mention all the communities, sure. but we see this in Alpena. We see this in Marquette. Community after community have, have realized this value proposition. They've, they've re-realized this value mm -hmm. that, that their face to the water just has inordinate value for them. Corporations are seeing that and how we really reconnect that and how communities and individuals and volunteers as well are just giving their heart and soul to recreate this mm -hmm. relationship that they have with something that they hold so dear. Right. There, there's an economic proposition, but there's a, an aesthetic proposition, but there's a human uh, uh, 
emotional proposition here too mm -hmm. that helps drive people's choice. And it's really ultimately around then choices that people make to continue to grow businesses, right. to choose to put businesses here, to think about how they're, they're connecting with their family. And it's really through those experiences that will ultimately drive that long-term stewardship. So what happens there at that, that narrow level ultimately drives experience, which I think drives stewardship. So, Skiles, can you, can you dive back into some of those specific examples that, that are driving that, that stewardship of the resource and why, what are the benefits that, obviously we can think about the benefits that nature's getting, but what are the benefits that, that the court, that you are getting as, as, as part of DTE Energy? Well, again, I, I'll first go to the, the personal, yeah. and I'll give a story of my, my CEO who has young boys. And uh, when we first look at, started looking at forestry and reforestation, his boys were sitting there watching some nature show on TV with him. And he says, well, what are you guys doing, Dad? <laughs> and, uh, and he came in the next day and said, what are you doing? What are you doing, Skiles? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it, so it gets personal all the way yeah. to the top of the company. And, but beyond that, you know, I mean, Things don't always work, and sure. we, you know, on the, I keep going back to the climate issue. When we were talking that cap and trade program a number of years ago, we started looking at forestation, uh, reforestation, and um, we made a lot of investments. We worked with a lot of partners, but it really wasn't coming together. So I think the previous panel talked a little bit about policy, mm -hmm. and you know, we haven't started thinking in the right way on policy. Um, you know, we, you know, we have a lot of engineers and a lot of uh, lawyers that work on these things and, and they think of the law and they think of in some manufactured solution to things. Uh, but, you know, we haven't yet switched over to yeah. really taking advantage of the environment. Yeah. I think we need to do that. Right. So I, I think this, this policy um, bump or barrier is interesting. Do you find either in your business in conservation forestry or your dealings in the municipal um, sector, that I think in the first panel we mentioned something along the lines was like maybe the science is a little bit and the partnerships are a little bit ahead of the policy. Um, but do you see, are you seeing some barriers to um, thinking differently that have limited your ability to do either forest conservation deals or implement municipal um, infrastructure ideas? I'll jump in. I think one of the barriers we see is the lack of understanding in an urban core mm -hmm. of why you would want to put a green roof on a building or why you would have bioswales and, and rain gardens and porous pavement. So it really gets down to looking at the multiple benefits of what some of these different uh, nature, mimic, mimicking of nature that we are looking at. How does that benefit the individual, you know, the right. urban forest that I talked about earlier? Why is that important to people? Um, and it goes to the economics as well. We um, went into one of our watersheds, Lincoln Creek, and removed all the concrete lining from that creek that right. my predecessor engineers put in place in the 60s and uh, naturalized the waterway. We put in green infrastructure throughout, and now we're seeing property values in that watershed go up by about 20%. Wow. So we need to talk about you know, the economics, the climate change is a huge issue. We really need to talk about just that, that core, what John was saying, that the emotion that it brings to people because they really do connect with nature. And I, I, the other thing is we really need to connect, as, as John said, you know, and I think sometimes in our cities, we've lost some of that connection. You know, I we have. talk to people when I'm old enough that whenever I was a little kid, you know, if I was inside the house, during the day, my mother said, Do you, are you sick or what? You know, and <coughs> outside. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we don't do as much of that. So we really need to do some things to educate and, and connect our city people to the, to the environment, whether it's urban forestation or just getting them out into the, the mm -hmm. surrounding areas. John, one thing I think you mentioned when we were talking a little bit earlier was this, this little bit of asymmetry and, again, this disconnectedness that maybe a, a restoration here or a restoration on the, on the shores of Lake Erie near one of your facilities. Um, there's a disconnect between doing that, some of the restoration, the benefit that it might provide somebody, as we talked about earlier, somebody lives downstream or somebody that, that's upstream in the forest. And, and so how do we deal with that kind of asymmetry or that disconnectedness? We've been exploring this for actually quite a while. How, so what currency do you use to compare thing, like things or dissimilar things? So part of that asymmetry, as you mentioned, is 
that humans generally tend to value the same amount of gain and the same amount of loss differently. Mm -hmm. We've actually value the same amount of loss more strongly than we would get value the gain. If I find $10 on the street, I feel pretty good about that. If I lose $10 by the end of the day, I actually feel worse off had mm -hmm. I not gone through that transaction. So there's a bit of asymmetry of what we think we gain and lose. But there's also an asymmetry when we're trying to compare things. For instance, you know, growing up, if I saw that you had a go-kart and I really wanted a go-kart ride, um, what am I really willing to, what, what's the value proposition for me for that go-kart? I don't have, can't trade you a go-kart ride. Right. I may trade you baseball cards. <laughs> so there's a real asymmetry in what we're trading, sure. but we both see some value yeah, in that. I think sort of nature services is, is also, how do I value, you know, 10 acres of wetlands versus, you know, uh, the ability to use water in irrigation or for something else? So putting, really trying to understand what the deeper value proposition is mm -hmm. in nature is an inordinately difficult problem. We can put a cash value on it at some level, right, right. but we we're also still trying to learn how to do that. What is the value of the ability of water to infiltrate into the ground and store that water for when I want to use it later when, when, when the season is dry and I need to put that on a crop. Mm -hmm. What is the inherent value of that? And how do I value a green infrastructure project versus something I know easily how to value, and that's the size of a pipe, right. the type of concrete, the depth of the ditch, and the amount of water I need to move. I know that cost and value. I'm not sure I can capture yet all the values that green infrastructure gives me. So, okay. so one thing I struggle with oftentimes is, is how much information do you need to make those decisions? Because you're making, you're making investment decisions in forestry. You're making decisions in green infrastructure, and you have to. There's aging infrastructure. Things are going to cause, cause a, a problem if you don't replace or repair. So how much information do you feel with? Do you, when do you feel comfortable? Because decisions have to get made no matter what. Decisions do have to get made. Yeah. And I really think with green infrastructure, it's, it's just common sense. I mean, a lot of these things, you want to put a lot of science and a lot of research into it which I think you need to do, but on some of these things, if I can put a rain barrel on a downspout and hold 55 gallons of water, that's 55 gallons mm -hmm. of water that's not going somewhere else, and you can use it later during a drought. So I think some of it's just common sense. In Milwaukee, we just jumped in. We said these are the right things to do. They, they help the environment. They help the economy. They improve the quality of life. We're going to do it, and um, just started investing. Yeah. So I think what we'd like to do is skip to another video here where we talk a, bit, a little bit about the green infrastructure um, as an example from Cleveland. And then we're going to dive in and specifically talk with Kevin about some examples from the city of Milwaukee. The Environmental Protection Agency keeps a long list of cities, each with a gushing problem. The list has 772 names, big cities, and small towns. Their problem? They've all got combined sewers. That is the sanitary sewer that carries the water from your toilet and connects to the storm drain. When there's a big rain, they combine. The sewer system can't handle it. The excess pours into the river or the lake. Gross. But that is a combined sewer overflow. And for the health of Lake Erie, we better do something about it. So if it's raining, it's a big deal. Here in Cleveland, we're spending $3 billion over the next 25 years just to fix it. Three billion dollars going into one big hole in the ground. Well, actually seven big holes. East of downtown, they're digging the first of these, called the Euclid Creek Tunnel. There's a rock chopping machine at the bottom of that shaft, cutting a tunnel 24 feet in diameter and three miles long beneath Lake Erie. Just has a massive cutting head on it with a lot of teeth on it, or bits, that, are, that, that will rotate slowly and start to pulverize and chew into the rock. That's some of the rock after it's been chewed up. So when these are fully erected, they would be 360 degrees. They've got two more years to go before this tunnel can act as a giant holding tank for sewer overflow until the nearby treatment plant can process it. I think that this project is amazing, but it's going down below where no one will ever see it, but all will benefit from it in the end by improved water quality. As big as this tunnel is, it can't hold all the combined overflows. So the sewer district needs everyone throughout the watershed to get involved and to help. The best way to do that, think about this simple concept, perviousness. While most things in the city are impervious, pervious things soak up the rainwater before it hits the storm drain. 
question of perviousness and imperviousness is just about pavement. You know, when human beings move into a, a place, the first thing we do is we pave things and we build structures. And so when the rain falls, it can't follow the sort of natural pattern of soaking in and, and returning to the waterways. It, instead, it cheats off into the sewer system. Urban planner Terry Schwartz is in the Lower Kinsman neighborhood, the Forgotten Triangle, where there aren't many neighbors left. It's a problem area for causing sewer overflows. It's so impervious around here. With all the grass where houses used to be, you would think that would help catch more of the rainwater. But you'd be wrong. But unfortunately, the demolition process leads to a lot of soil compaction. So even though we have more and more vacant land, a lot of it isn't really helping in terms of the runoff. Solutions are in the works, creating what's called the green infrastructure. Here, urban farms break up the compacted soil, catch some of the rainwater, and make food instead of sewer overflows. Over at University Circle, a new hotel is growing up. Green infrastructure? It's in there. So this is the pervious paver that is being used for the driveway and the parking lot area here. Pervious pavers let the water get down to the sand underneath. That's an estimated 1 million gallons of water that won't get into storm drains from this one acre site every year. You know, it's sort of a smarter design as opposed to just throwing down some asphalt and striping it and putting cars on it. Help cutting down on overflows isn't confined to downtown. Five miles as the crow flies from Lake Erie in South Euclid, an urban marsh now helps to cut down on runoff. Five years ago, this was an ugly stormwater retention basin. Now, it's a green infrastructure showcase. You can see it from Victoria and Norbert Cohn's tea house. Before the wetlands was developed, it was an apocalyptical wasteland of concrete and field grass. And in the summer, it was burnt out. It was just barren. It didn't seem to make sense to people why it was there or what it was doing. This is the old Langerdale catch basin, and it would overflow and flood neighborhoods, ruining stuff in people's basements. The city decided it better do something. And the idea came up of an urban marsh to actually look at how to use nature and use those techniques to actually clean the water tributary and handle the stormwater management. You feel like you're in the country now, Are you like you're in the, the woods and you're in the city. The That's urban so marsh is a lovely piece of perviousness the sewer district wants to see more of. Plus, it's adding to the economy. Property values around these types of green spaces typically go up. And Victoria's Tea House well, you'd better make a reservation for next year because it's booked up through this season. Makes you wonder why everyone just doesn't go pervious. We have to do what we have to do to solve problems. But the hope is we can create solutions that blend in with community objectives. Whether it's urban farms or other economic development opportunities, there's ways to do this. Control stormwater, but still create something for the community. And, and we're going to look aggressively at that aspect. Thanks, that was some great examples of investments we can make in the urban infrastructure that again, provide the multiple benefits from attracting people um, back to these places, from providing business opportunities, and again, providing the natural benefits that we all like to see. Um, the Nature Conservancy is doing a, a small study with uh, Grand Valley State University looking at the relationship between Phragmites, as we talked about earlier, and property values. And again, we begin to see a relationship. There's a relationship emerging where you see these invasive species are actually decreasing property values. And so I like, Kevin, what you said at, at the end of our last little bit was some of these decisions are, are pretty clear and not that hard to make. They just make sense. Um, Milwaukee has a long history of investing in kind of blue and green infrastructure. So can, can you take us back to the, how that emerged in the 80s or 90s? Well, some of that was before I was there. That's but right. um, yeah, in 1993, we put on our first tunnel online. So it's been operating for 20 years. And we reduced our combined sewer overflows, which you just heard them talking about, from 50 down to 2.4. So we're well within our regulatory uh, limits. We are um, doing much better than the feds and the state tell us to do with our overflows. But that was during, you know, that went online in 93. I came to the district in 1998. And we saw people still wanting more. They wanted to enjoy the rivers more. They wanted to connect to the rivers more. They wanted to be part of nature in that urban core. And so we looked at it and we said, you know, we could continue building pipes, we could continue building tunnels, but the issue is not so much what we are overflowing, it's our connection to nature. So we really changed our approach in the early 2000s. We said we need to be more 
of a take a, a greener approach to how we move forward with these issues. And so we initiated in 2001 a green seams project where we're purchasing buffers way upstream in the watershed outside my sewer service area, getting my public to understand that what we spent our our municipal dollars on upstream help them from a flooding standpoint, from a nature standpoint. We've got over 10 acres of green roofs uh, installed today. Uh, we've been doing this for the last 11, 12 years. Uh, we've got um, porous pavement. We've got over 18,000 rain barrels installed in the area. So we've really driven the message. Before the message was, okay, what's the city going to do? What's the suburbs going to do? We're driving the message down to what's, what are you going to do in your backyard? What can you do to help? And it's really um, helped connect that whole message. Again, what I talked about right, before right. with urban forests, bringing it down to the individual and saying, this is what you can do to help. And don't always rely on government because there's not a lot of funding. We're not going to see that funding anymore. But there's very simple, low-cost things that um, the homeowner can do or the business can do. Mm -hmm. And it, it helps everyone. So you, you mentioned those CSO results you're getting. Are you, what other results are you seeing? Are you seeing the improvement in water quality? Are you seeing the more fishable and swimmable streams? And well, we're not too fishable, swimmable yet, but we are more fishable, yeah. swimmable. And, you know, that's, that's going to be kind of an elusive goal as we move forward. Mm -hmm. But um, we are seeing the, the waterways improve. We're seeing fish migrate back up yeah. the waterways where before uh, the rivers were just dead. Nothing lived there. And, and we did it to ourselves. So we learned from our mistakes and we moved forward. We built the tunnel. We, we reduced overflows to two, two and a half. Um, we're starting to see, we're, we're taking the concrete out. So we're starting to see salmon migrate back up oh. the waterways. And Lincoln Creek, the, the watershed I talked about before, uh, we spent $119 million, that upfront cost that was talked about in the first panel, removed concrete, naturalized the waterway. And the first year after it was completed, the salmon started migrating upstream and they would go upstream and die. And all of a sudden the DNR, Department of Natural Resources, calls us and says, we have all these dead fish, what do we do? And we said, well, that's neat. That's what salmon do. That's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> so uh, it was a problem that we weren't planning on, but um, it really brought people back to um, why we're here and what we do, right. and that, that, that inner emotion for the environment. So it's interesting to me is we all have certain stakeholders that we interact with a lot, investors, um, and, and your company or the, or the, the residents of the state. So are these stakeholders getting it? Are, are the people that, that are supporting you, are they, are they getting it? Are they seeing these values? I, I, every community that I visited, I think I mentioned a little bit, we're, we're just seeing huge hope and huge desire and huge effort within communities to connect, whether that's, whether that's businesses, whether that's individuals, or churches or conservation stewards, they're seeing this relationship and they're really working towards their own strength of their own community. They're doing the work, whether it's a rain barrel or, or you know, coming out with a shovel and helping you know, you know, to restore uh, yeah. some their system. We saw a long period of time where we where we pulled a lot of wealth out of the Great Lakes from the beaver through timber, through ores and other things. And there's still capacity to create that wealth. But we're also looking at the capacity to use that wealth in the perpetuation of the very thing that we find the most valuable. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the relationship and the ability to continue that in perpetuity. We see that on the forest side. Mm -hmm. So I think people are getting that. I think we're going to see that, that this is our, our period of time. These decades that we're mm -hmm. in right now, are, are, we're going to look back and say, we, we started something to re-put something back in place that people have great value, and I think people are seeing the value right. proposition in this. So, Skiles, we're working, the Nature Conservancy is working with DT Energy kind of in, in Western Lake Geary, trying to um, develop this, the set of choices you can make in which to invest. Um, why is that so important? Well, I think, you know, our stakeholders getting it? I think, yes, they're getting it, but I think we're still in the infant stage. Right and we're just starting to get it and I think it's organizations like the Nature Conservancy that can really help us and help businesses, help individuals and to the project that you mentioned you know is really to identify okay we want to work in Western Lake Erie what are all the things that we need to do in that area that connect to the people that uh, take care of issues like the Phragmites mm -hmm. Um, and you know, identify those so that as a business, you know, we're an energy company. We're, we're good at delivering energy, but you know, we're not experts in that. So you know, we look to groups like yours 
to, to help us. And, and I think a lot of businesses are the same way is, you know, give me multiple choice and, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll go out and do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. right. But, you know, we don't have the resources or the expertise necessarily to go out and identify those opportunities. So we kind of, Kent, I think, talked about those resources and the availability of those resources. Um, you deal a lot with that private investment, but where do you see the, the, that kind of combination of public and private investment and the importance of that and where it could be going in the future? That's a great question be, because the, the public financing is such a critical component to most conservation deals at some level. Uh, it doesn't have to be all of it. It just has to be a piece of it. And then you use that to leverage with private uh, philanthropy and you, pr and you leverage that with uh, private investment dollars. And then you can go out and do large projects. But without kind of a core of conservation funding, it gets very difficult. I, I think the other thing to think about is I sort of put my crystal ball, pull out my crystal ball and try to look into the future in conservation. Water is critical. Right. Uh, and uh, people's willingness to pay for water, the sort of New York City project has now been replicated in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and in other places like that. And, and water funds for the provision of clean water become a way that Kevin can get his job done yeah. uh, because the, the rate payers will pay to protect upstate uh, up uh, in the watershed. So, and that ties into the people that are managing the forest. So, so where do we? I guess, Kevin, where do we see that creativity come from, those, those ideas about, you know, we could just try this. We could establish a water fund. You know, what if it doesn't work? Um, you know, so where do, where do we get that creativity? Where do we get those ideas? Where do we, you know, are, are, are we able to take those chances? Oh, sure. Well, I, the, the great ideas come from my staff. They come yeah. from neighborhood groups. They come from the community themselves. Just bringing in new ideas and thinking differently. One of the... Uh, the benefits, you are asking about the benefits to a company of, of going green with some of these issues. The benefits that we've seen is phenomenal staff, young yeah. folks that really want to have a say in what their environment looks like. So I see the ideas coming from all sources, that whole partnership, collaborative uh, uh, approach that we talked about earlier. If they don't work, then I get blamed for it, and that's okay. But, um, you know, we, we, need to, uh, we need to try new things. We need to show that some of these things don't need to cost a million or two million dollars. They can be done on a very cost-effective local level. Uh, John, I, I, I think we we're I think we're still inventing here. I yeah. know Kyle said we're in the infancy, and and I agree. I, we see great capacity, and and people are understanding this. But I think we're still inventing our way into this in some ways. For for decades, we understood sort of how to start to deal with the point source world, and now we're really trying to understand both the non-point source world in terms of stress, runoff, and those kinds of things, and stormwater management. Mm -hmm. And we're still inventing those mechanisms. So how do, you, how do you capture the value that this brings back to all of us mm -hmm. and use the value that that brings back to all of us to actually support the system itself? We're trying to learn how to create that loop. How do you use nature to create value, to create wealth, to create jobs, to create community, to create culture, to connect people? and then use the ability to increase that wealth to actually service those things that created it in the beginning. We're, 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 what we used to see as a very linear you know, system, front to back, we're trying to figure out how to turn that loop and say the very value that we're creating is being turned back on itself to service the very thing we love the most. I think that's a great point. I'd like to add on to that. The, the idea that creating value and being able to put a value on something in a market enables uh, the innovation and, and, uh, and creativity of everybody mm -hmm. to say, okay, maybe I can create a business out of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think we need to focus on that is that regulatory structures may not provide solutions, but markets and, uh, and uh, people focused on innovation mm -hmm. that can benefit from that will. Mm -hmm. You also yeah. have to understand that this may not be the number one priority for Joe Citizen. Right. You know, they got to put food on the table, they got to keep, get a job, keep a job. And so this falls down on that priority list. So what we need to do is what the first panel talked about, try to connect the dots that says this does impact mm -hmm. the food on your table, this does affect mm -hmm. your job, mm -hmm. it does affect the economic vitality of the community and of the watershed. So that's, we really got to drive the message home. Yeah. Skiles, any closing? Yeah, well, I think it, it uh, always gets back to partnerships that I think, you know, 
none of us have all the answers, none of us have uh, all the resources, the expertise, but if we all start thinking this way, we really have a tremendous opportunity. And, you know, nature's been around a long time and they're great at it, you know, it's great. So, you know, it knows how to do it and all we have to do is make use of that. Yeah, I think getting back to Steve's idea was like kind of mainstreaming these ideas and even though we might be at just our, our, our infancy in that, you know, we might be able to bring John back 10 years from now. How are things going to look different if I get you back on stage here in 10 years? I, I Besides think, us. I, 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 a little I, more makeup. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I'm, I'm in, always incredibly hopeful because I think we're thinking through the hard work of how to do this. I think we're going to be proud that we started this work maybe a little frustrated that we didn't start it earlier right. and maybe a little frustrated that we didn't go fast enough because there's always faster, right, yeah. in, in, in terms of the world we live in. But I think we're going to look back and say we did the right thing, right. We're doing the right thing, and we're thinking about it the right way. Okay. I hope so, too. But I gave you guys some easy questions. Now we're going to go to a couple audience members that are really going to uh, give it to you. So Good. go ahead. Good morning. My name is John Hardigan. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And my question for the panel is, what can a consumer do to make a difference in the purchasing, purchasing choices they make every day? Buy local, Buy local. Uh, conserve water, which is really hard to talk about in the Great Lakes because we have so much of it. We're, we're really spoiled right. with the uh, great water supply that we have. So, you know, the consumer can buy local. They can look at the... Um, type of products that they buy, what those impacts might be on the environment, and then try to conserve water. Right. Demand, demand a product that has the amenities that they want to see in that product. If it's corn flakes, how was the corn grown? Right. right? If, it's, if it's another product, how was that product produced? If it's a wood product, was it certified? You know, did it come from a exactly, place that yeah. had, does it, does it come from the place that has the values that I have? That's the, that's the question consumers need to ask themselves. Right. Yeah. And as an energy company, you know, it's energy efficiency. You know, be efficient in everything that you do. Right. And yeah, uh, that's, you know, tough for us because we make money selling quantity. <laughs> but, uh, but, but now we have a way in Michigan to make a little right. bit of money conserving. Right. And, so. and actually saving water is saving energy. Absolutely. We right. spend a lot of money in this country and in this state in, on the energy side of just moving water around. The more water you save, Absolutely. water's... You know, you don't save water because water the same amount of water is here as was, but you really ultimately save energy in that yeah. proposition. That's right. So next question. Hi, this is really an awesome program. Thank you for uh, taking my question. I'm Marie Donigan. I'm the executive director of the North Oakland Headwaters Land Conservancy. And we've been preserving land in the headwaters of the Clinton, Flint, Shiawassee, Huron Rivers for the last 40 years, 1,400 acres to be exact, which is great for a small volunteer mm -hmm. Land Conservancy, and we want to be your partners, and uh, we believe that we are the NGO, or one of the NGO solutions for land conservation and environmental protection, and we are, as you said, boots on the ground. But we are also small fish in a very big pond, and so we want to know, or I want to know, how can we, our small, volunteer, underfunded land conservancy, become a bigger uh, you know, part of the solution, be, be a bigger part of this whole picture? Let me, let me start, and I'm sure others have a feeling. So the land conservancies, each individual one sort of reflects their place. But, but you also act in concert with a, a variety of other land conservancies and through your organizations like Heart of the Lakes and others that really sort of help amplify your voice. So it's really understanding not just how to make that work within your place, within your community, but how that voice does amplify up and, and connecting to that, to that bigger body of work. So we see that, plus it also, in, specifically in the conservancy side, it also resonates with a breadth of individuals. And I think that's an important piece too. It's a very important voice in how people see themselves in their land. So I, I, even though you're small and even though you feel underfunded, I'm going to continue to encourage you to do that hard work because people see that work and they see it play out in their community. And I, I think there's think an it goes back value to, there. Sorry, I think it goes back to something Kevin said earlier, which is tying people in the urban core into natural areas. Right. And local land trusts working in an urban environment are creating sort of the future of the kids that are going to value this stuff in the future. Right. I can tell you what we did in Milwaukee. We've got the Green Seams program 
we're a bunch of engineers. We don't manage land very well. You know, that's not our forte. So we work with the uh, different envir non-environmental groups, uh, land trusts, Ozaki Washington Land Trust, River Revitalization Foundation, Mequon Nature Preserve. We purchase the property, we put an easement on it, and then we turn that property over to the land trust and they manage the property. And so. oh, I'm sorry, I think we have uh, one more question waiting here from Dwight Washington. This is a short question, and there's been a lot of talk about putting value on the water, and that's something that's hard to do in the Great Lakes region. And so it brought to my mind that one of the natural resources in Alaska, oil that's used, that people in the state get compensated for um, being citizens there. And I was wondering if there's ever been any discussion or talk about uh, compensating people from Michigan to be conservative, to be efficient and with water usage. Why that's a panel of discussion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. But I think it's one of those challenging creative ideas yeah, is, is where we throw some of those ideas out, yeah. borrow, I, borrow I, these ideas. I would say it's a bit um, interesting, quite frankly, that most people don't pay for water. You, you pay a water bill, but people don't pay for water. I mean, the community puts a well down, and what you're really paying for isn't the water, you're paying for the infrastructure necessary to support that water. So we have a long legacy of actually not paying or not putting a actual price on the water itself. We have a reasonable use system in Michigan that says people's use is reasonable. We ended up pay, we end up paying for water industrially, uh, but we pay for the infrastructure to support it. But the notion of how do you service that becomes very important. Well, thank you all very much today. It's been a great discussion. You never know where it's going to go. We started talking about forests, which some people wouldn't expect too much to hear in the Great Lakes, and we actually even got the go-karts and, and baseball cards. <laughs> So um, I, I think it's really interesting. I'd like to see these kind of patterns that emerge. And it's, it's obviously this connectedness, connectedness between habitats and places and people, not just what's just adjacent to you, but what might be hundreds of miles away. And this idea of, of these values and these partnerships, it's connectedness both to nature, but connectedness to one another. Um, so again, thank you very much. Great discussion today. And now back to Christy. All right. Thanks so much, Patrick. We want to thank both Patrick Doran and Catherine Call, our moderators today on Great Lakes Now Connect. To learn more about what investments are being made in your part of the Great Lakes Basin, just go to greatlakesnow.org and you can also learn more about the Nature Conservancy. Plus, you'll be able to see this entire program there as well and you can share it with your friends. Just a reminder that next month is Great Lakes Week in Milwaukee. It's a gathering of government agencies, activists, industry leaders and academics all talking about the future of the Great Lakes and how to protect this amazing natural resource. Detroit Public Television will be broadcasting the entire conference to public television stations around the Great Lakes. So make sure you join us the second week in September and check greatlakesnow.org for updates. For all of us at Detroit Public TV and the Nature Conservancy, we hope you've enjoyed Great Lakes Now Connect. I'm Christy McDonald. Take care. We'll see you next time.